Hello everyone, this is Michael Jacobs. I'd like to welcome you to Science of the Golf Swing, show number two. We have a lot to cover today. The book has been out for three weeks now. There's a lot to talk about the science of the golf swing. It's so great to see, and it's really nice to see a culmination of all this work. Finally reach out to all the, all the golf enthusiasts out there. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I did putting it all together. One of the big things and questions that have popped up we actually have a list that we're going to get to today, is the difference between the space and the user frame, and both are extremely necessary. And I, and I tried to point out that in, in the book. So what I want you to envision here is here's a golf club with a little person sitting right here, best I could draw. And we choose the general position at, of impact, which I explained in the book. And then what the space frame does is it gives us an idea of how much the golf club rotated in all three dimensions, alpha, beta, and gamma, on the backswing, downswing, and follow through. That's how we're able to um, get the angular change of the swing, which is a big deal. And now that everybody in the golf world knows how much this, the, the rotation of the club uh, factors in now from learning all the stuff from Dr. Nesbitt, it's very important that you're used to the space frame. So how would we reconstruct a backswing from purely the space frame? Well, if I, uh, this goes back to the swing angle. So let me, let me just give you a little example of how I would do it if I was working with somebody. First, I'd rotate it around an angle alpha. So let's say this is my top of the backswing position right there. How did I get there? What did this observer see me do? Well. What this observer saw was I rotated it around an angle alpha so the, 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 the plane would stay orientated towards the camera and I rotated it not quite 270 but like that, right? So that would be it. So you could see that's not my top of the backswing position I just showed you. So there's more rotations that need to take place. I normally on my backswing also have a beta angle of about 30. So now I gotta pitch the nose up about 30. Still not my top of the backswing. I must now rotate it gamma wise about 90 degrees. So what I mean by that is my gamma rotation 90. So let's put all those together now. So we got around an angle alpha, beta, gamma 90, and now you have a pretty good representation of where I was at the top of the backswing. And that's all we're doing when we talk space frame. We're uh, reconstructing how the angles changed. Then we're watching how the angles change when they come back to impact, do that over time, and you get all types of information, like f angular velocity and stuff like that. And that's the way 3D rigid, by 3D rigid body dynamics Kinematically, that's how it's done. Now, when you talk about the kinetic, because the club is rotating and the center of mass, the alpha, beta, gamma, those little sticks that you see in my book, the axes, alpha, beta, gamma, because they move with the club, now the actions that I create are different relative to what the space guy sees, but not relative to the user one. What do I mean? Let's put this all together for you. Well, if I go like this, and I do a positive like alpha torquing action like this, the wings of my plane yawed this way to my left like this. So it's like on this side of me. Yet if I do this at the top of the swing, right, you could see that it goes more out in front of me. So this is the same this is the same action no matter where it is but you can see how it has a different orientation to the little space guy so what has to be done is what's happening in the user force across the shaft is always force across the shaft force up on the grip positive alpha force is always positive alpha force but you have to marry the space to the user so the user ends up being the instantaneous speeding up and slowing down of the alpha beta gammas throughout throughout the swing so that's what that's why it's important you have to have both i know it's confusing but think of it as 
an observer from a fixed space to the observer who's moving with the club. And they're married together in the dynamic equations of motion. Okay? When it comes to 3D rigid by body dynamics, it's the alpha, beta, gamma forces that are the way that you would, you would do it. Okay, so let's get to a whole bunch of questions now, and I hope that cleared up the space and the user frame a little bit, and at least gives you a little bit of uh, an upper hand on the okay, info. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. First question, more videos on using its practical applications, teaching, drills. Well, just to, you could use that space frame, alpha, beta, gamma, like I just showed you, to show people how much they, they uh, are able to rotate the club. So if I could only do a very little bit of alpha angle like this, right, I might have to do more beta then to get more of a traditional top of the backswing type position. So that's why you could explain to somebody if they can't alpha, um, move it around the alpha clock enough, they're going to start to then move it around more of the beta stuff. So that's an important practical application for just this conversation. But uh, that was from Paul Whalen and Paul, we will do a practical thing every time we do a video. Uh, Mike Ris Richardson, forces and torques in the transition. Okay, and what happens during Wesley Franklin during the downswing? Okay, so of, of that the uncocking of the wrist. All right, so those are, those are tied together. So what, what's happening in that area of the swing? Well, if you follow in the book, that generally right around this time in the backswing, when the alpha, beta, gamma user frame is at the right side of the golfer, that is generally where um, what they, they were positive alpha forcing to bring it back, we hope, a good player, positive alpha forcing to get to about this point, and then it'll start to become a negative alpha force where they'll push the tail down, and you can see that that will make the plane want to rotate towards me like this. Okay. So I will be applying a positive beta torque to offset that. You could, you could see how, um, when you look at how stable it was in those golfers in the book, how stable uh, they were able to manage this type of, of action. Um, it's, uh, I think it's really important than doing something really wild because when you do something wild at the end of the swing, it's usually in this direction. So as it's coming up to the top of the backswing, negative alpha force, things starts going like this. I'm applying a positive beta torque and they're basically offsetting each other. Negative gamma force and I'm up at the top. And then it depends on uh, my beta force, if it's, if it's going more behind me or if I'm trying to push the mass center more out in front of me. So um, those are the dimensions. So let's say it's pretty neutral up at the top, how much it's behind or, f or forward of me. Now, that force this way, up on the plane like this, right? The, re high, the hands reach their highest point, and then as the body starts transitioning, that is actually maintained this way. Now at about this point, after the hands of, after the club has reversed its direction, now the golfer will then switch it to an actual positive alpha force. And this is a key move. I've heard it been talked about that it should be all positive coupling and torquing here. Uh, not in the proper frame for 3D rigid body dynamics. So when you're coming down, what's actually happening is you're applying a positive alpha force like this, which is going to make the nose want to dive down. You'll then torque in this direction to ease that plane down. Okay, so I'm going to ask people to redefine what they call laying the, laying the club down to this plane of motion where we start to pull up on the tail and ease the nose down. And then as I come into last parallel, where would I want to be to, have to get the club around is what I always ask my students. Okay. So, you will generally reach your peak at pulling up 
with that positive alpha force right around here and then it'll start to drop because you just can only do so much. But you will come into impact with still some or maybe very little positive alpha force. It starts to subside depending on the player. And as a result there will be just a little bit of negative beta torque this way to stop the club from doing too much of that. So that's that plane of motion. When it comes to the before, the, the behind and in front, you know it's quite popular these days to go like this with the club and on the downswing. And what you have to understand is this. If I go like this and I really try to lay it down this way and I push my hands up like this, all I did really was yaw the club into a super handle drag position. So by doing that and I bring the club down and I'm bringing the club down, as I come around, I have to put in a massive amount of alpha torque to get there. You're kind of putting yourself in a little bit of a disadvantage. So when it comes to the behind you and in front of you, what you have to understand is if the airplane or the club is up like this and then I want to accelerate the mass center more behind me, let's say, and that would be a positive beta force. That would be positive beta force. Now when that happens, it positively alpha rotates the club. That's what you have to understand. So when I'm up here and I positive beta force it, it wants to positively alpha rotate the club. So then I would have to do a negative alpha torque to offset that. The sum alpha will always be positive. So you want to understand that when things are um, balancing out, let's say. So if I did something like this, right, at the start of the downswing, and I did a massive negative beta force like this, right? And I went whew, negative beta force. That's going to create a negative alpha response, which I'll have to be applying positive alpha torque to offset. And the sum alpha from every golfer I've ever seen is always just a little bit positive. So the more you try to force it this way, negative beta force, the more torque you're going to have to apply that'll win out by a very, very small margin. So dropping the club more behind you, people have called this shallowing uh, for a long time. That might be the case, so-called from the space frame, but the instantaneous kinetic is the user frame. So I'd be very careful in how you look at those two areas. Okay, so hopefully that helps those questions. Show the, how the airplane should fly during the whole swing. Well, everybody's different, right? Um, what I recommended, what I always recommend people say, how should it go? Well, I just usually pick um, nice smooth movements. So a nice blend, let's say, of linear and angular. For me, it's real important, I think, especially when I'm teaching, if I could get the person at last parallel to have that airplane in a pretty decent, spot to where there's nothing like let's say for example it's too far behind me like this and my body's going like that i've heard people call it early extension and all this but look at how much negative beta force right negative beta force which gives me a, a negative alpha response and how much alpha torque i'm going to have to bank around with so for as the airplane should fly i would do it in as in a smooth of a blend of linear and angular. A before and after swing. Okay, that's something we can do. That's a little more beyond the scope of a little show. Uh, some myth busters. I think the deep shallowing of the club should be a myth, bu a myth buster. Um, beta forces in the backswing. I don't understand figure 95. All right, so um, before we look at any of the figures, beta force on the backswing is this. So positive beta force would be like that. Negative beta force would be like this. So for it to be a force, the mass center has to accelerate in that direction. So if the mass center accelerates in the positive beta direction, 
we have positive beta force, and then likewise, and then negative likewise. So I think people are just, you know, going through the book and they're passing over all the pictures. They're, they're in there for a reason. I gave pictures their own page. I could have just, you know, put them in a little squares and the book would have been half the price and um, there wouldn't have been so many colored pages. They're there and they're big because this is the first publishing of this and the better you get at understanding these things down the line, it's going to be easier for you to see. So when you look at the beta force quiver, what you're doing is you're seeing all, on the backswing, you're seeing all the positions of the hub and club and then out of the grip you're either seeing a green arrow or a red arrow. Green means positive beta force, red means negative. And then the scale of how big they are are all relative to each other, relative to that beta. So if you see a big green uh, quiver coming out of there, you know that's a large positive beta force. If you see a red one, you know it's a negative beta force. And then when that golf club is like coming down this way into impact, you're always going to get a <laughs> negative beta force coming into impact. By definition of rigid body dynamics makes positive alpha torque necessary. So the whole you could only have negative alpha torque down at the bottom is, is an erroneous um, conclusion. Okay, hopefully that helped. Interpreting quivers. Well, uh, it, that should help the torque quivers, red and green. And then you have force quivers that are alpha, beta, gamma forces quivers. You see those, they're kind of self-explanatory. Um, the scale is, they're all relative to each other. Um, and then you have normal, tangential, binormal. And then you have some of the forces applied to the grip point, which is the sum of normal, tangential, binormal. If you're into studying normal, tangential, binormal. I'm going to read your book this weekend. I've never taken any of your courses. Is there anything I should read or before I do or <laughs> anything I should read before to prepare myself? Um, well, let us know how you do. <laughs> Just go into it. Maybe this is for Alpha Man. In transition, should the golfer actively lead more with their arm sequence? Yeah, that would be Alpha Man. We're just talking about the experience of the golf club right now. All right, we have one more sheet. Okay, gamma. So somebody asked that they've noticed that gamma torque goes negative before impact. So what that means is if I'm positively gamma torquing, right, I'm rolling the plane this way. So what that means is coming down in the downswing, the, you'll see that a lot of the arrows are green. So the person's, uh, the quivers are green, the person's positively gamma torquing. And then right before impact, they start to just apply a little bit of negative gamma torque to slow down the gamma ro rotation of the club. Um, that's very common. And I think if you're a great player, you've kind of felt that little bit of reversing gamma. I, there was somebody out there who said, oh, I feel the negative couple. I feel the negative couple. Um, it can't be the alpha torque one back here. What you probably felt was uh, you're laying down with the beta torque and alpha force, and then you felt your uh, negative gamma torque. So that's the story so far. Hope you enjoyed Science of the Golf Swing, show number two. Hope you're enjoying the book. We have a lifetime supply of information coming.